Hi, my name is Callie Burke. I'm here at Kennedy Space Center, and we've been talking about um, the different having Google Hangouts for each of our three different Kennedy Space Center challenges um, that we've developed that we're having people worldwide work on, and we're really excited. We've seen uh, some of the teams have been already reporting different things. So we're going to talk about space wearables uh, for this uh, Hangout. And so one thing we have is actually is fun. It's a local challenge. And so this is our location. We have people working on stuff in addition to um, uh, hosting challenges. And this is one of the th ones where we're going to be having uh, launch viewing opportunity prizes for the winners worldwide in these three challenges. So if you work on the Space Wearables project, um, you know, if you're nominated for global judging, um, you can put up a 30 second video and put a summary and put all your resources and go into global judging. Well, additionally, even if you're not nominated for global judging, you can still, for space wearables, be judged by the Kennedy Space Center judges. And so do the exact same things by April 17th. Uh, fill out, uh, put in the 30 second video and put, on, uh, put in all your information on there and we'll have our local teams here look at those challenges. And I'll show you guys that we had uh, something last year for our three Kennedy challenges. We had people come out for the Maven launch, and so this is the signatures from them. Um, and so we have people from all over the world who came and viewed. And so you'll, the winning teams will get to have two guests or two of their team members be NASA invited guests, and then each of those team members will get one additional. And so I will um, turn it over to David to go ahead and talk about the Space Wearables Challenge. Thank you, Kelly. Hi, I'm David Miranda. Uh, I created this challenge um, because I had a big interest in wearables and how we can apply this technology here at NASA and specifically Kennedy Space Center. Uh, but what this challenge is all about is it's for both designing a wearable for an astronaut in space in either inter International Space Station or in a future mission to an asteroid, that type of stuff, or uh, here at Kennedy Space Center. We have a lot of ground technicians that do a lot of work setting up a rocket um, integrating all the pieces, and I think there's value in uh, wearable technology there as well. So that's what this challenge is about. Develop a technology. Um, I'm muted. No, but this, oh, this sorry. one, you're sorry. good. <laughs> Develop a technology that, uh, a wearable technology that could either be wear in your glasses, wear it on your watch, or something else. And we're really looking for innovative ideas that can help people in space and on Earth help with the space exploration mission. Okay. And so do you guys each want to introduce yourselves? Okay. I'm Nick Kindred. Um, I'm, I guess I'm this, uh, this is a smart matter expert on uh, ground processing for space vehicles. Um, I've been part of the processing team at the Kennedy Space Center for uh, going to be 30 years next year, so 29 years I've um, worked with Space Shuttle as a technician, as an engineer, um, as a uh, project manager, and currently working on the Orion program, um, which is the next space capsule that will take men into space for NASA. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so my name is Joshua Manning, and I'm a, a, a NASA software engineer with the Ground Systems Development and Operations Program, which is our current uh, follow-on program to the shuttle that will be processing the the large NASA rocket that we call the Space Launch System, or SLS, you may have heard, as well as the Orion vehicle, which we also call the MPCV, or the Multipurpose Crew Vehicle, um, and those are used interchangeably. And what I do is I work on large software systems, um, primarily in the area of work control. So this is something that I've been interested in. We use a lot of, we've historically used a lot of paper systems to to do our, uh, we call flow processing, or uh, and things that Nick, Nick can talk a little bit more to in, in depth. And we're, we're evolving uh, toward more technology adoption. So we've gone, uh, you know, over the years to using computers more and more, but a computer is a bulky, as a bulky piece of hardware that you have to carry around with you. Um, sometimes you're, you're doing uh, sensitive operations or complex operations. You may not want to have that kind of hardware um, near the facility, in the facility, you may not want to be you know, carrying that around with you, even a tablet, is still something that you have to manage with your hands. So um, we, we kind of saw wearables and the emerging, emerging technology with things like Google Glass and heads-up displays and watches as an opportunity to 
uh, maybe provide uh, additional information during during these um, during during processing where they, you know our technicians and our engineers can be quote unquote hands free or you know they could even be inputs to a stream back to to a control room if you will or or another group where they're monitoring progress. So we see there's a lot of potential. Um, applications for wearable technology, and it's such a rapidly changing market that it, it is just a domain that we, we want to investigate a little bit more. Um, but I think that the challenge itself is is interesting, and in, in the idea of embedding computing into uh, astronaut clothing or devices that they would wear, and having all that information on hand, readily in context, as as um, you know, as as we perform our functions in our jobs. So. It's, and I'm, I, as you already heard, I'm David Miranda. I work at Kennedy Space Center. Um, I work for the IT director, specifically the part of the IT director that does a lot of research into new technology areas. And so uh, the work I've done in the past has been a lot of modeling simulation, uh, specifically discrete event simulation. But more recently, I've moved into the area of more software development and lo looking at technologies and seeing how we can apply them here at work at NASA. So we've looked at things like 3D printing. We looked at a lot of touch technologies, so touch tables. Um, tablets, and so this new area that we're in, very interested in is the, the wearable technologies because GSDO is a program headquartered at Kennedy Space Center, and as the IT directorate is a supporting organization, we want to develop applications and software and hardware that can support our programs. And so we're looking at wearable technologies for all of the reasons that Josh mentioned. So, and that's why I created this challenge because we have ideas, but we really want the world's ideas on how to make these challenges occur. Um, actually, the, the program director of GSDO um, was here today at Kennedy Space Center to, to introduce the Space Apps Challenge, and he called it our annual Get the World to Work for Us for Free event. <laughs> and so thank you for working on this challenge, and we definitely are going to look into your ideas and potentially use them here at Kennedy Space Center and maybe other centers who I know do this type of work as well especially in the realm of wearables, um, I'm sure are going to be interested in the results that come out of uh, this particular challenge. Yep. So, and great. And um, so I just wanted to reiterate that uh, we can take questions either on Twitter using the hashtag space wearables, um, or we have a question and answer portion of the Google Hangout. So if you guys want to post them there. But um, switch back over to you guys. And so, um, uh, one question I have is, um, so you mentioned a couple things you guys have looked into, but what are some some uh, projects that you guys are aware of here, um, being in the Spaceport Innovators Group, of new technologies that Kennedy's uh, has already taken advantage of? In terms of what type of technology? Or just you know things that, that we're working on. You know, like we have uh, the Swampworks has taken part of mm -hmm. the visualization that you work that you do. Right. So um, I guess so the variety of technology. Um, um, one of the groups I work in, we do a lot of uh, visualizations of ground processing of hardware. So um, just go to the YouTube page for NASA Kennedy, and you'll see a video of uh, ground processing for the SLS rocket here at Kennedy Space Center. And I mean, there's been a lot of work done by the GSEO program of all this, showing you every step that goes along the way to process this gigantic rocket, this new Saturn V scale rocket. Um, and so there's been a lot of work in virtually building this world. Um, and making sure that everything works in the virtual world so that when we build in the real world, um, we do it right the first time. Um, I guess what other stuff have we seen in Space for Innovators that uh, would be of interest? Well, maybe we could do a little plug on Space for Innovators. Sure. <laughs> I think <laughs> some, some background information. So uh, our day job, we kind of gave a background on our day jobs, but we're, we're passionate about trying to understand uh, more or less how to make our jobs and our work uh, more innovative. I mean, how can we adopt sort of the best breed of technology or even just ways of thinking and, and try to apply it in, in the context of, of ground systems for NASA. And so um, a few years ago, David, you were on the founding team, right? No, I was not actually. But it was still about four or five years ago? About, yeah. uh, we started a group called the Spaceport Innovators. And that's essentially we're chartered with trying to coordinate, organize events at, at the center and, 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 and get folks engaged and involved and aware of of sort of the innovative practices out in industry and, and on center. So uh, we try to meet pretty regularly to just dis to discuss things like you know uh, a new you know a new a new technology that emerges. Is there a, you know can we apply it to something that we do out here? 
we, we look at both literature and you know and hardware and software. So it's a pretty broad range of things that we, we try to get our arms around. And um, so so that's a little bit of background on that. We do that kind of in our free time, if you will. So um, and that's kind of what you know why we're here. It's sort of it's prompted us into a lot of these sort of uh, engagements and discussions, which which are exciting. So we do get access to a lot of um, kind of in, you know exciting and interesting things going on center. And I think the Swamp Works Swamp Works Lab is a pretty good um, testament of, of, of innovative thinking applied at Kennedy. And so they, they deal mostly in technologies related to regolith or uh, lunar or Martian soil. And uh, they have a lot of engineering applications there. I'm trying to think of specific to this to this topic, if we've come across any you know mobile or wearable technology that's being used currently at KSC. We know there's a there's a group um, the the office of the uh, CIO, uh, the chief information officer, they have an IT labs function where they, they seed sort of early uh, projects that may they may have a lot of application to our industry. And one of them recently was specifically for Google Glass, correct? It was well, actually for a wearable. Right? Oh, was it? It was okay. not specifically okay. Google Glass, yeah. And so I'm, I'm aware of that, but that's in, in its early stages. So. I'm not sure how mature how mature that project is. I, I believe they're just starting out, and it's actually an agency-wide team. You have uh, we have people from Kennedy Space Center, but also from another center that are working together on this particular challenge. Um, but there's also been research in the past in this area. I know in the early 2000s, uh, 2001, I believe, and in 2004, uh, there were studies done at Kennedy Space Center and at um, what was at Goddard. Where they looked at space wearables, but even though 2001 and 2004 is not that long ago, it it's actually centuries away in terms of technology, at least in this in this area of technology, because back then the wearables were very bulky things. Yeah. They were heavy to use, very difficult. In fact, they talked about in the uh, in the Goddard study, they mentioned the fact that the wearable was too big to fit under uh, a bun uh, one of those bunny suits that you wear in a clean room. It was too big. And nowadays, our wearables are like you could mistake my watch for a wearable right now, or my glasses for a wearable. They're that small. So there's been leaps and bounds in the technology. Um, and that's about all I know in that area that's been done at NASA, at least. One one program that I know that uh, kind of was going on for a while, and they had a, they started the constellation. I think it was called uh, um, Him or something like that. It was uh, where they they outfitted people. They actually got it from the, the uh, movie industry. They outfitted people in outfits, and they used these different cameras, and they captured. Uh, they could put them in simulated situations, and then uh, turn them into a computer models. And and by using those computer computer models, they could tell like the stress of the like how, how much right. weight that you know the person was. So motion capture. It. Yeah, motion capture mm -hmm. is what it was, and uh, but it was really good because we could set up operations that we knew the technicians were going to have to do, and then. Give them boxes that we thought like these components would weigh, and it would tell whether it was too much weight on the back or too much weight on the front. And it was really good. It helped us model a lot of these operations that we right. wondered, you know, how well they would work. And actually, that could be an interesting application to uh, for a space wearable because that's a lot of uh, basically faking it and then doing studies on that. But what would be interesting right. is if you get something that could measure that type of data live and feed that back to technicians or um, doctors and you know, say you're lifting too much, or this astronaut, that big boulder you're picking up on Mars, it's going to kill you. It's, 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 yeah, you model it ahead of time and find out what right. it's going to work. It's, it's all simulation, you know. So. Yeah, I know. I always find it interesting when I, uh, when I work um, for things, and uh, I'm a trajectory analyst, but they'll sometimes show us. Uh, they do the ergonomics, and so they make sure that you know of the technicians of certain heights can actually fit into it. Because sometimes when you're processing spacecraft and, and launch vehicles, there are some really tight spaces. I mean, you have to worry about uh, a lot of things and whether or not you can actually reach the part you're you're getting to. Um, so, well, why don't we have uh, Nick actually give us maybe ground processing 101? Okay. Um, well, first of all, I guess. Uh, the, the difference kind of with the new program versus shuttle was we're actually uh, doing a little more assembly here than what shuttle did. So in the ONC building, we're actually manufacturing, putting together the capsule for Orion. Um, so there's a lot more going on than what we had in shuttle. So we we assemble the, the 
crew module, which is the little cone-looking thing that looks like the Apollo capsule. We assemble that on top of the service module, which provides all the commodities and stuff for space once they get out and astronauts are floating around. So we put that together in the ONC building. We do detail check out, all the fluid system leak checks and everything. We push that out into another building where the, uh, another, the operator contract takes over and we service the vehicle. So we load uh, gaseous oxygen and nitrogen for breathing. Um, we load um, uh, the propellants that use when you, when the space vehicle gets in space and you have to steer around. You know, you know, it's a different situation. You have little jets that require fuel to push them around, and that's uh, nitrogen tetroxide and monomethyl hydrazine. So we will use that to steer it around. So those got to be loaded. They're very toxic. And we have to do. We have to load those in special suits. Um, then we load uh, ammonia, which is really pure ammonia. It's very hazardous. Also, we pressurize stuff to high pressures, like 6,000 psi. Um, so we do all that stuff in another building. In the meantime, in parallel, the rocket's being assembled, um, and that's the solid rocket boosters are being built up. Um, we have the what's called the core, which is um, a huge tank that holds the hydrogen and oxygen. Uh, they assemble all that together, and they get it ready for the Orion spacecraft, which is the spacecraft that the astronauts go up in. Um, so they do all that assembly in the big VAB building, um, which if you're ever here in Florida and you come down and visit the Space Center, you need to go out and see it's a huge building, one of the biggest buildings in the world. So they'll assemble all that together. They'll do final tests. They'll do integrated tests, make sure the whole rocket and uh, capsule all you know, talk to each other and fit together, and then they'll roll out to the launch pad. And, uh, and for this program, it'll be, uh, we think we're, it's about a five to seven day stay. We'll go into launch countdown, and we'll shoot it up. Okay. And I liked how uh, you were talking about the vehicle assembly building. There's a great picture of it right behind you. <laughs> Telling you just how high the doors are. So it's it's quite the building. Uh, you can fit the Statue of Liberty inside. Um, Eight of them, excellent. You know, okay, see, I didn't have that factor. I knew the height was there. Because <laughs> it's only, yeah, I think the Statue of Liberty is only around 316 or so feet. I, that, actually, that's not a good quote. Okay, well, we have um, we have a question, okay, from Alessandra uh, Tizoni, who actually, he worked on our deployable greenhouse one last year, so I he came out for the Maven launch. Um, and it's asking, do you have any strategies for... Um, <clears throat> to preventing osteoporosis and muscle stiffening in space. And so it's, you know, talk, thinking about how there's exo, <clears throat> exoskeleton suit solutions and how that might help. So. Um, well, I, that's not my area of expertise, but I can, I know um, they are looking at resistance type, you know, resistance bands and stuff like that because you don't have gravity. I, I know a lot of it has to do with... Um, you know, they have treadmills and shuttle, I know, in the space lab, these treadmills where they had elastic that kept them, elastic straps that kept them held down. But I think, you know, one of the things I'll look at is suits that actually have uh, restraints in them so that you can continuously have cons restraints on your on your muscle, you know, your muscle. But that doesn't help your heart. I think one of the big things that they have, the issues is, uh, you know, that after a while, one of the limiting factors is your heart, because it doesn't have gravity, you know, Starts to starts to I don't know where I'm looking for is but and the muscle atrophy atrophy right right so you get atrophy so um, that's kind of a tricky one that I don't think they've quite figured out they have they'll have to figure that out for Mars so I don't know if it would be some kind of uh, implant or something or some type of um, something that would get the heart rate up you know on a regular basis so. Well, that's one thing, and maybe where wearables would tie in is that as they develop these exoskeleton suits. Um, maybe they don't just provide resistance, but they tell you what that resistance is. Right. And mm -hmm. so you embed it in, into it. Yes, this would be almost, and this is totally outside of my area of expertise, but it's a, it's a fun thought exercise, I think. I don't know if this, you know, it would be so much not in the, um, like an EVA or extra, extra uh, vehicle, you know, vehicular activity as, as much as I think it would be during, if it was a long duration mission where you're, where you're just waiting, you know, eight and a half months to get to your destination that you you may want to have a uh, uh, some kind of a suit that can either maybe monitor muscle fatigue or or, or wear or atrophy, or maybe it is um, it is it just a like a large body band. So as you're you're doing small movements, it's it's 
it's creating that effect. So it'd be interesting. Um, it's something I hadn't really thought of uh, in the context of, of the, the, the paradigm of wearables uh, before today, but I, I could definitely see where you could have a suit embedded with that kind of feedback information and, and have it giving intelligence. Maybe you know, you're not working your left leg as much as the rest of your body and taking a dominant right step, and it, and it can help you adjust just movements. And I'm, sure there's, I'm sure there are folks looking into it. And it'd be interesting to see if there's current military applications, because I know that there's a lot of exos exoskeleton research there from a from a battle perspective, so. Yeah, I don't know. Our ast yeah, it is a good question. I know our astronauts have a, a hard enough, t you know, we, we on Earth have a hard enough time dealing with our own ergonomics, let alone you go up in space and it all changes. So, um, and Alessandro joined us from Rome, Italy, and we actually are excited. We have um, a team here at KSC that's working on uh, space wearables, and um, one of our participants is happens to be in town from Italy, so that's great. Um, so, Another question is, um, is how many people um, regularly would work on the, um, or actually, so uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to backtrack just a minute. So uh, Nick, you've been talking about how we do ground processing um, for, we're looking for out of the GSDO, but um, there's also ground processing that our commercial partners are doing. So what's the connection between Kennedy's uh, ground processing and the commercial partners who do that work? Um, out of our office, we do have people that are following the, the commercial, and uh, I think the kind of the, the thing with commercial is we're, we kind of want to try to stay out of their, their business as much as possible, let them come up with commercial solutions rather than, you know, NASA has always been so uh, proactive inside the contractors with selling stuff, so I, we're kind of taking an approach where we're kind of hanging back, we're letting them kind of come up with... Uh, their best practices from commercial and then being advisors to them and kind of monitoring them. Of course, um, you know, the funds are provided. You know, right now there's still competition going amongst them on who's going to take people to the space station. But, uh, but kind of the approach is let's just see kind of what they come up with and as long as they stay within the guidelines of safety and stuff like that for the astronauts, and we're going to kind of let them tell us. Okay. And so I was actually, so I'm bi a little biased. I work for the Launch Services Program, which currently has launches going on. And we work with companies such as United Launch Alliance, Orbital Sciences, and SpaceX. And so we do have engineers <coughs> who go and they, they observe the ground processing and, and we, uh, for our missions. Um, but, uh, but again, yeah, they let the contractors, as long as the contractors are doing the appropriate work, we don't direct them how to do it. We just make sure that the proper work is, is, is occurring. And it's the processes that they've set up in their company and agreed to. So, but yeah, um, so next question I'll go back is, uh, is how many people does it take to process a rocket or a spacecraft? Um, you know, when I was on the space shuttle, it, we had a lot of people. It took a lot of people. It was a very complicated spacecraft. Um, after this, the space shuttle shut down, um, the operator contract, I believe, don't anybody quote me on this, but I think it's like around 1,500 people, which includes the engineers, technicians, and uh, and all the support people that are required to do that. So, um, and again, that's uh, that's that would include the rocket assembly, rocket checkout, that the core piece, which is the cryogenic section that you know makes the main engines go, and then also the um, the the Orion capsule that we, we put together in the process. And that, that's after the Orion is put together, so that would be all the servicing, uh, assembly of the rocket and launch. Okay. And, um, and how many different types of jobs do people have on the shuttle? You had all those people, but how many different kinds of roles were they filling? Ah, uh, gosh, you know what? You, <laughs> you can't imagine. I mean, um, I, I started out in aircraft the aircraft business when I first came out of school. I worked for Piper, and uh, I was a flight line technician. And when I interviewed for the job out here, I, there was literally a team of maybe three people on every aircraft, and we did everything. We checked it out, we troubleshot it, we did all that stuff. So I thought when I was interviewing for the job for the shuttle, I thought, man, this is this is going to be a tough job. It's going to be like I'm thinking there's going to be like five of us that are going to be out here. And I'm going to have to do everything on the space shuttle, you know. And I get out there, and it's, uh, I mean, it's just a swarm of people. It was probably two to 300 people just working on the shuttle, just in the processing facility. And uh, 
there's everything from the thermal systems, which is the tile, to fluids. You have specialists in every system, and um, you have to really get to know down to the, the ultimate detail of all the stuff because you run into stuff. Space is complicated. It's you know it's a very unforgiving environment. You trend problems. You know you you watch for trends and things. Um, and you have to continually be honest. So every one of these systems, like um, like a hypergol system, like uh, will have one whole team of specialists, and those specialists will go across the country. We right now we're talking with uh, Europeans at ESA. Um, we talk to people at White Sands. We talk to people in Glenn Research Center. So we we each system has a very dedicated team of very highly specialized people. That is interesting. You mentioned you know we look at we look at trends and, and try to collect a lot of data. And so kind of pulling back to the, the theme a little bit, one of the areas we thought that, that may be an interesting application for uh, you know, these uh, microprocessors and wearable devices with the context of ground processing is uh, these vital signs, collecting data, exposure to things like uh, hypergols and, and other hazardous gases over time. We have a contractor out here that collects that data and they have uh, sensors that they'll send out in the field and you know, you'll have to wear them separately. It's not part of the, the, the uniform, if you will, of a technician or an engineer out um, working in the, in the facilities out here. And, and, and many probably still have a little asbestos, if you will. But, uh, so, you know, there's, um, those are the kinds of uh, applications we're thinking here. I mean, as a, as a really as a you know, data collector and a, and a source of input um, is in collecting that data and doing trend analysis and making sure that, you know, folks are safe. And um, again, applying that all the way across the spectrum. I mean, that's, um, we can we can protect uh, we can uh, advance and sort of uh, uh, perfect that kind of technology here on Earth, but then you know trying to find out you know is that can, you know then evolving that and seeing if it's something that would be useful for for astronauts when they're you know can it apply to when they're processing and, and turning wrenches um, you know on on the lunar or Martian surface in 15, 20, 30 years. So yeah, there's a um, for instance I, I know like the shuttle the or the technicians that are working out in this processing facilities. I think hydrazine is like the sixth most toxic chemical in the yeah. world. So the exposure levels are like, uh, we try to protect for like 10 parts per billion, which is like extremely small. And when these guys are out working around it, um, that knowing what they've been exposed to, you know, sometimes if you have a leak or something, if, if the suits have detection that can record, you know, what they've been exposed to and yeah. stuff, you know, that, that data is, uh, would be very valuable to have because um, for instance, hydrazine is a cancer-causing agent, and, 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 and it, it accumulates. Yeah. So, so having that type of data on people would be very good. Safety is one of our most uh, highest priority, and we, we have an excellent safety record at the Space Center. You know, considering all the hazardous operations that we do, we've had uh, our our accident rate is very, very, very low. So, um, it's to us, it's at it's the utmost. Um, importance to us, you know, process. And I just have to, when you talk about uh, the dangers of hydrazine, if anyone's seen the movie Europa Report, the substance that the astronaut got on him, that they, they had concerns with him bringing it into their uh, space vehicle was hydrazine. So, well, we have a question from, another one from Alessandro, and it's about the extravehicular mobility unit. Um, and he has some detailed questions, but I wanted to just check before I even mention this if any of you guys are really very informed on that, because I think that's really a Johnson project. But do you have some? I actually did work. On oh, the, okay. The, uh, this is the the unit that shuttle had, I believe. That um, I think in uh, gravity that showed the guy the guy out. Oh, out George around. Clooney. Yeah, uh, he was that was that was an EMU, if, if I believe that that's what he's talking about. Yeah, I think I think so. And so um, we'll try. Let's see. So he had a questions about the gloves, and if you're aware of any of the main issues they had with those gloves. And I know gloves in particular. I used to work with a guy that uh, did the Apollo spacesuits, and uh, I know in particular one of the problems with gloves is the is the astronauts' hands get cold, you know, after so long. So um, it, it's very extremely cold in space. So. So I know after when they're out there after a while that um, that their hands get cold. The other thing about them is when the suit is pressurized, the fingers get really hard to move. So astronauts will work a lot on the ground before the flight uh, doing hand exercises because with the inflated suit and inflated gloves, it takes extra strength to, to bring them down. So 
you know, if there's something in something in there that could help them relieve uh, how hard it is to, to close the fist and stuff, that might um, that might be helpful too. That would help with the fatigue. So their spacewalks are what six hours, something like that. So, so they're they're out for a long time. So something like that might be useful. And then he said, "There's a couple more questions about the amium. We'll see which ones uh, the extravehicular, or extravehicular mobility unit. Um, another one is what materials were employed <coughs> for it and um, for them, particularly the the hard upper torso um, portion of it." I'm going to refrain from that one because I really okay. don't know well enough. So that's one we'll have to. Uh, I've seen the materials and uh, some of that stuff they have like I don't know. I'm, I'm going to just refrain from that. I don't okay. Know. Sorry. So we're not that. Yeah. No. And um, and are you aware of any upgrades that they're working on for those? I know the suits are I, the so, suits are totally uh, under redesign. I know the the suits that they wear for launch, which is different than the uh, extra. Curricular uh, suits. I I know they're different now. They're they're working on those, so, and I haven't seen them. I don't know exactly what the upgrades are, but I know they are redoing them. And they did. Um, we were talking about this a little earlier. They uh, so the, yeah, JSC or Johnson Space Center takes the lead on on those designs, but and I believe they just sent out the three latest designs. And I don't know, you know, for if it's if it was their main mission, um, uh, uh, but it, they had three designs that they. Put out and and the public were to, to vote on. So you can see those designs. I don't. I mean, I'm, I don't know the direct route to get there, but I'm sure if you Google, you know, astronaut uh, latest designs, then you may be able to find them. But it was they're three very interesting designs. They're similar. Um, they look. They do look a lot more um, flexible and and slim and and. Uh, I, but I don't know if they address specifically the glove the glove issues. But I'm sure they. I'm sure they're working. On it. But it, there wasn't enough specific technical data that I can see. You know, one one thing I would say, the uh, the whole astronauts, you know, the, the flight suits and all that stuff, and we were just talking about that. It's very sexy because you know that's the thing that everybody sees on TV and stuff. But if you really want to make money doing this and you really want to make a wave, the ground processing, anything that comes up, you know, that helps with that, is going to apply to the rest of industry, and uh, that would be significant. You know, that would be significant improvements that would apply to all kinds of different industries that deal with hazardous stuff or deal all with process and stuff. Yeah. So, so um, that's a real opportunity for some entrepreneur out there that uh, you think of. And we, and we go and we look both ways. We look into industry at other analogous fields to see if there are, um, you know, in, in for example, uh, in the medical industry, they, they tend to have very some, some similar technologies that we can adopt for our, our critical processes. So uh, I think there are, um, it's, it's one of the, Spin-off type focused uh, technologies, and that you know, if you if you can come up with these sensors or devices or wearables or, or complex system integrations that that would work well to either you know, receive uh, environmental information and that can be you know uh, context sensitive and then provide that as an input to something you know to some some uh, manufacturing process. I mean, I think that there's uh, there's a, there's a lot to be gained from it. But you're right. I mean, it is <laughs> even the even the new astronaut suits. Um, the uh, they they have a, a tech, one of them was called technology where the design is and it had um, in, in, embedded technology into the design of the suit itself and they could I believe um, they could send information to it and it would it had a very uh, it looked like a very kind of at the, the current what I saw looked like a limited feedback but it would change colors and I think that they were using it to differentiate the astronauts but also maybe if um, if there was a if they were having an issue it would turn red I believe and, and then they could use it as a visual indicator. Um, amongst, I'm sure, uh, like a mood suit. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <They're fresh laughs> <from it. Yeah. laughs> so, oh, great. Um, and then, so we have a question from um, the UK, and so they're making, um, and I'm not sure if I'm saying the city right, an exter, a connected spacesuit for astronauts to wear inside the I ISS, and so the International Space Station, because most of the time, you know, they're usually wearing uh, more casual, comfortable clothes, and so. Um, is there any functionality um, like clothing or accessories you, you guys might suggest for the microgravity environment? Well, I mean, I'm not an astronaut, but I, I can hazard a guess that I think the main functionality I think they would look for is something that makes things hands-free, because they're, they're doing a lot of experiments up there. They're doing experiments and also trying to maintain the space station at the same time. 
I mean, if, you, if you ever look at videos of astronauts doing work, they usually have attached to the wall a laptop or they have a little notebook that they take notes on. Um, so I think a big feature that would be helpful for them is to be able to do that work hands-free and not worry about typing in instructions or looking at instructions. In fact, if you look at any astronaut training manuals or guides for doing work in space, it's checklist after checklist after checklist. And if you could eliminate those checklists completely and just make it something that, uh, like for example, with a heads-up display type thing where the checklist appears up there, I think uh, that can make their lives much easier uh, up in space. Yeah, that, and that's kind of the same issue. Those two same are same issues with ground processing people and astronauts. That, um, with this techno with technology, there's so much stuff you have to reference. There's drawings. If you need to go look in something, you put something together. You need to uh, get detailed. Um, there's lots of specifications that have to be referenced. I mean, there's the data. There's a ton of data that you have to reference. So if there was some way to be able to do that hands-free, that would apply to technicians and astronauts. And and I've heard um, Andy Allen, you know, was talking the other day, and that was one of his main things that he brought up. And I know. Uh, working with um, you know people from flight offices, and but I know that's a big that's a big issue because you just can't take all those books up. You know you watch those old uh, shuttle watches and stuff. These guys had these flip flip through things, which was crazy. You know I mean they were emergency procedures and stuff they had in books and stuff. And and uh, if you can have that stuff, you know readily available, you know at voice command or whatever. I know like in doctors' offices you know, they uh, record data and stuff, talking to them. You know I don't know. If it, Directly converse to text or whatever, but stuff like that would be helpful, you know, to be able to record data and stuff. And um, and if it was, in, I think again, venturing a guess because oh, we're all sort of ground based here at Kennedy. Uh, the uh, if it's a connected spacesuit and that information can be, um, uh, I guess, context sensitive to, you know, the environment, the space station environment. So if, if there was an emergency, I mean, really, when you think about. Um, information at a glance, if you're in an emergency situation, you're trying to troubleshoot something, having the relevant information readily accessible in a meaningful, digestible format is much, much more um, you know, valuable than, than having a stack of you know, what-if manuals that you have to flip through um, to try to troubleshoot something. So if it's a true connected you know, suit and it can be fed um, status information, station information, and uh, you know, if there's a trigger, if there's something that you have to do, it gives you a sort of a truncated set of operations to perform, or maybe it uh, it phones home, or you know, it does a bunch of other things. You're already kind of connected to the system. That would be, I'm sure, something valuable. I, I wish we had an astronaut here to to give you a real use case. Well, I can I can tell you one thing. Um, I I know for the, the space shuttle, they usually had one either pilot or co-pilot that was always sat in the seat monitored. Um, shuttle systems. So, if if you could pull that, you know your base your base systems where you could monitor because usually there's somebody that's monitoring systems all the time. And if you didn't have to sit at a computer or sit in front of the CRT sure. up in the cockpit, you could go about doing your normal job, and then uh, you could keep track of the the base system data. Yeah. And same way the ground personnel, if they don't have to be sitting up into the control room uh, monitoring systems when the systems are powered up and stuff, you go about doing the regular work. Right. And could keep an eye on their system pressures or alerts that came up and stuff like that, and that would be helpful. And I think that's one of the beauties in general of technologies we are today is that in the past we have to go to books, reference manuals, and find information. But you know, with context-sensitive information, the, it's like it takes you right to the page of the book that you need. It knows what the situation you're in, and it finds you the information you need. And even the space station, even though it's not that big, if you think about it, it's the size of a football field. And so if, it, if you're working on an experiment on one side of the space station, you get an alert. I mean, these, these systems could work as a, a, a GPS inside a space station to say, go over here, turn left, and this is where the uh, issue is occurring on the space station. And I have a couple. So, and, and John Nahoud asked the question, so thanks, David. He liked your, the early, for your earlier part of the response. But um, I know just uh, from hearing astronauts talk, one of the things um, that uh, they sometimes get frustrated with is, uh, you know, they have to maintain this basically a, a, a space station, and it's, it's like a six-bedroom house. And so it takes a lot of things, and so sometimes they'd be off and going through supplies, and so if uh, somebody um, from the ground just saw them and it kind of just looks like they're digging around, well, there's some tasks the astronaut's working on, but then they get a call from the ground, hey, can you go do this, and it just kind of adds a lot of tasks. 
Um, so maybe something to have the astronauts be able to kind of convey their point of view a little bit better to the ground so the ground can get a better idea of what's really going on with the astronaut. And then also, um, and I'm not sure about the whole, the policies on the, the space station, but um, when I've, uh, for grad school, there was a spheres project and we had the astronauts actually running our experiments. And so sometimes they'd be working on something and then they'd have to go get the microphone to either convey information or else they'd be in the middle of a task and then the ground would call them and they'd have to go get the microphone. So something to make, um, make them be able to communicate a little bit more smoothly without having to constantly go back to a physical object um, I think would be really useful, at least just, just some of the observations that I've, I've seen. So good question. You know, the visual part of that too, engineers and technicians and engineers and astronauts, so they're trying to tell each other, sometimes they communicate what they're seeing, you know, but if, uh, if the camera was right there on what the guy was looking at and you could be talking, that, that would help, especially on the ground. I'm sure they, they have more of that already probably in space, but on the ground, a lot of times when you're an engineer sitting up in the control room and the technician's trying to tell you what he's seeing or what the problem is, if you actually see it, you know, and it would, it's, it's huge. You know, make a big difference. Okay. And, um, and apparently, so, so let's see, John also says, awesome beard to Josh. And they have uh, astronaut Tim Peake, who is a, um, a United European Space Industry ad astronaut who's been giving um, them a perspective. And so um, we were just saying, uh, great, we're really happy that you guys have him there. And if Tim is willing to share with the rest of the world, if you guys would want to do a Google Hangout with him, for him to talk about the astronaut perspective, um, I'm sure everyone else would really appreciate that. For sure. yeah. So um, let's see. And then, uh, oh, and so apparently Tim said he would like um, an embedded camera and the microphone. So yeah. great. I'm glad that was, that was useful for them. <laughs> um, OK. And. So, and then we also have another question for Alessandro, from Alessandro about um, advantages of, and again, this isn't your guys' expertise, but maybe you can speak to it, of exoskeleton suits for missions on Mars or asteroids. I think particularly looking for places where, uh, yeah, gravity is not, not the norm. I, I think what's interesting about this question is I had a, a frame of mind but, you know, wearables is kind of a word that I think is emerging as into our vernacular as a way to describe all these technologies that are small and light enough that it, they become accessories. And we joked about it as being fashion accessories. And um, we were joking earlier about maybe we should have brought in as a consultant, uh, you know, a fashion designer. But um, I had never thought about a wearable um, as a full suit. You know, which is oh, a literal sense of right. wearing. Um, I mean, even if you think about it, a, a spacesuit is a wearable uh, in that respect. And um, and some of the projects that I, that we've seen that I got picked up today, you know, are are larger objects um, that are that are great. So this is kind of extends that that metaphor all the way to a, a full suit. So again, not my expertise, but I think um, any any suit that enhances your physical ability to perform your job, whether it's mining or digging or Staying grounded or moving quickly or um, providing feedback to to your tasks, uh, embedding any type of sensors and again providing any information. If you can, if your exoskeleton can essentially be your computing system and it's in, it's informed by your movements, coupled by you know we have um, we have a project down here where it's a uh, I'm trying to think of the, I, think, I believe the project is called Razor. I don't know how familiar you guys are with it, but it has sensors built into. The the uh, the tires or the track of the of the um, the rover and it uh, it gives it the intent is you know it, it reads the, the 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 soil makeup the regolith makeup uh, as it's traversing so it can it can look for maybe points of interest so you know you have an exoskeleton for example that you have a sort of similar technology on your shoes so as you're walking around you know you're getting you're getting feedback in terms of the composition of the, of the ground you're standing on so I think it's one of those. It's a question. It's a very good question. I think you could answer it a million ways. Um, but uh, but I appreciate the perspective because I, I hadn't really been thinking about that really. I would say one thing, and like I said, this would apply to ground also. I, I've always thought about the thermal conditioning, that, you know, the the heat and uh, cold regulation. And if you could come up with a solution, you know, that that could also apply on the ground that was 
Like right now, I think they use these white, the white, I've seen the white suits with the tubes run through them and all that stuff. But if you could really have a really efficient suit that you could wear that would uh, maintain temperature, I mean, just think what an advantage that would be on the ground. Like out here in Florida, I mean, if you could get it cheap and efficient enough, plumbers could be wearing these things and it would change their whole. The whole job would, would totally change. I mean, you could, it, it would it'd be a hot seller if you could get it, uh, you know, if you could get it cheap and efficient. So I think thermal is one big one. I think for astronauts, one of the big things is radiation. So, you know, if you could do something to help with radiation, I mean, that is one of the constraints right now to go to Mars, is the amount of radiation. Yeah. And right now, I don't think we can go to Mars because of that until we get that figured out. So, so something to do with uh, detection and reflection of radiation. That, and, I'm not an expert in that. I know that's a tough one, but I know that's what they're wrestling with. Yeah, uh, it's one of the many challenges. But um, And one thing I just wanted to mention, we've been talking about fashion designers. So there's a, kind of an interesting story back, I think it was in 2009, there was this astronaut glove challenge. And the, um, the second place team, actually, um, the person who was on it, Ted Southern, he was... Um, he designed the angel wings for Victoria's Secret. So he was really a designer. And then... Um, and through doing this astronaut glove challenge, he got second place in the competition, and then he actually ended up with a NASA contract for working on fashion gloves. So I'm not sure if he still is, but definitely um, fashion designers <laughs> do have a lot to bring um, to that. And just that's why we do the Space Apps Challenge, is that we want people, you know, all kinds of perspectives um, are going are gonna to help us um, with, uh, with coming up with innovative ideas, you know. Because um, they are something different from there. All right, and we have another question from the challenge, and it's uh, from um, Andrea, and um, and she wants to know if I develop a technology that is able to transmit remote signals with only the movement of a finger, um, what would you like to control with this technology? You know, tools, remote systems, so something where you can, uh, it's a wearable, I guess, that can then send commands. Hmm. Well, that would be good. I mean, uh, when, uh, with, with ground processing, I know uh, the way it works, we do a lot of remote operations. So um, we'll have the engineer be in the launch control room, and he'll have his computer. And then out in the field, in one of the processing areas, he will send commands via a keyboard to open and close valves out in the field, or, or uh, you know, ex which is executing commands to do stuff. So um, I guess if you had, you know, I guess if an engineer now could be out on, in the field with a um, technician and could uh, execute commands from where it was at just, you know, by motion or something. I guess that would be, uh, you know, I could see where that would that would be helpful or bringing up information in a simulated keyboard or something, I guess, would be a, would uh, definitely be a handy thing. I don't know. But I, guess so. I, I think one thing we have to be careful with with these type of controls is that they're still going to be doing things with their hands. So you don't want this signal to mean launch a rocket, and then you're grabbing a wrench, and you've launched five rockets. So, but I, I agree. I think anything that limits the amount of input necessary, the more natural inputs, I think could be useful for a technician anywhere, whether it's in space on Earth, working on space things, or uh, in the factory line. So yeah, you have to think about a deliberate, a deliberate but easy movement that you can, uh, can do. And a, a lot of times when you issue a command, you have a two-step. Two right. So you would, you know, you would have to figure that in. You would figure two-step. You'd like to say you wouldn't want to be moving hands. Right. Oops, I forgot to shut off. My, uh, <laughs> right. Um, so. so thanks. And that was uh, from Lapri Andrea. So um, and apparently uh, they do have UK. They have fashion designers there working with them. Awesome. So that was good to hear. Um, okay. And let's see. So we're actually getting close to wrapping it up. So if you guys have anything, um, thank you, everyone who's been joining us. We really appreciate it. But we'll, and we'll let these guys come back in, and if there's anything they want to say to wrap up. But again, we just want to pre say appreciation for you guys for tuning in and for sending so questions. So anything you guys want to say to wrap up? Uh, the only thing I would say is uh, think about the ground processing because uh, you know I, the astronaut thing's sexy. There's a lot of people working on that, but you figure out something to make a plumber's job easier or a technician's job easier. Uh, there's a, a lot to uh, you can make a lot of money, and it would be uh, help the world out right <laughs> in a lot of ways. 
And uh, I guess my, my final parting thoughts are, I, I love this conversation we've been having today because like, like Josh mentioned, you've already in your questions, we can see you're thinking differently than I was thinking at least when I came up with the question. So and that's exactly the reason we wanted this question up there because you guys have innovative ideas that we're not even thinking about because we may be too focused on a certain area and you're thinking differently. So um, I'm really excited to see what solutions you come up with to this challenge. And I've, I've been looking at the Hackpad and I've been looking at uh, some of the projects up there and I can already see people are thinking differently. So, and again, uh, astronauts is not the only thing. Ground processing, help us out. So I'm gonna, uh, <laughs> I'm gonna tag on that. So, the, um, so it's sort of a selfish motive for me to be here because working in ground systems, I think any, you know, with, the, with respect to wearables, it's something that where we've actually been actively thinking about and it's, um, you know, as we try to reduce costs, but specifically processing costs, try to make our, ourselves more efficient and safe, uh, it's something that we want to invest in downstream. We think we can infuse this kind of technology into our, our, our routine, our operations routine, and ultimately it'll, it'll make uh, you know, our program more affordable, it'll allow us to do more engineering and science. So um, there, is, there is real infusion and real opportunity to take you know, these ideas and these concepts that you guys come up with and really vet them through you know, a maturation process. This is this could be more, at least from my perspective, um, within ground systems. This could be more than just a weekend thought exercise. So it is something that you know I want to pair at least to that. Um, you know, we're the I you know I think we have the right influence and we have the right people. Our my uh, my program manager in charge of that program was here earlier. He he's well aware of these kinds of uh, challenges that we're looking at. So there is real opportunity here. And again, you know, if we can apply it on the ground here, there is a significant potential commercial use in, in, in many other parts of the real world. So uh, I just want to thank everybody for their time, especially those folks from, from all over the world that are, that are, um, that are heavily engaged in this. We've, we've seen a lot of great ideas already, and this has been a great discussion. So I really appreciate it. And I just want to add one more thing. You, you mentioned affordability. And I think what we always have to remember is that even though the astronauts are the ones out there touching space, the ones who get the astronauts up there are here at Kennedy Space Center. And so if we can bring our costs down, that means we can do more of those cool missions to other places. So sure. if you want to help the astronauts, you help the ground as well. <laughs> you need to help the ground first. Yeah, and if you can uh, if you can make it better and more efficient, then we can do it faster. Yeah. <laughs> and we can do it more often. Right. So thanks. And you guys, there are a couple more questions that have come up. But if you guys want to post those on the hack pad, um, as David said, he's going to be monitoring that so we can get them there. But thank you guys so much. Uh, we really look forward to seeing you guys' solutions. Um, so again, we're going to reiterate, please put up those 30-second videos. We, wanna, we want you guys to explain what your challenge is and put all your resources um, on your pages so that um, we can get some great ideas and um, and we can build off of them for everyone. So thank you guys so much. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.